so very much. We are so appreciative uh, again for your service and all that you've done. And those who are active military now, uh, our prayers are with you and our thanks are to you uh, as well. If you have your Bible with you today, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Kings with me, 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, we're going to step out of the book of Nehemiah uh, here for a week and go to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings at the front of your Old Testament. So I want to encourage you, uh, if you would please, go ahead and find that. As we always do at Little Fly, we're going to be very tied to Scripture and to the Word of God. And I want you to see uh, how God's Word is going to just kind of lead us through the truth uh, that we're going to be looking at today. And so 1 Kings, again, over towards the front of your Bible in the Old Testament and find chapter number 19. We're going to look at the life of Elijah today, and uh, many of you will know the stories of Elijah. Elijah is a prophet of God, one who prophesies on behalf of God, thus says the Lord, uh, one who led the children of Israel, one who we're going to see at one moment is the mighty number one prophet of God. He is on the mountaintop, and then at the next moment, he's going to be down in the valley. Sort of like Tennessee volunteer fans on the mountaintop. And Louisville and Kentucky fans in the valley. I'm sorry. The truth is the truth, all right? And I just got to put it out there. I don't get many opportunities to do that anymore. Mountaintop Valley. We all have experienced both, I'm guessing, who are in the room today. There have been those times in our life when everything is great and awesome. The car is running, the, the air conditioner, the heater, everything's working. Things at work are great. We're getting promotions and appreciated. Our family's doing well. Our children are behaving. Our grandchildren are doing great. And life is wonderful. We've also probably, everybody in the room today, have experienced those periods in our life when things aren't so wonderful. You got bad news at the doctor, which I know for a fact happens. You just had a financial setback, maybe, in your family. Your marriage is not clicking for some reason. They just can't seem to get all everything moving in the right uh, direction in your marriage. Your children maybe have disappointed you, and you have found it to be a very difficult and discouraging time in your life. And so what I want to do today is hopefully encourage you, and the title of today's message is Strength for the Journey. How do I find in God the strength that I need, whether I'm on the mountaintop, whether I am going somewhere in between, or whether life has hit an all-time low maybe, and I'm in the valley? How do I find the strength of the Lord that I'm going to need regardless of the circumstances of my life? So many times in life, if we're not careful, we are living our life based solely upon circumstances. And every, depending on what the circumstance is, if the circumstances are good, I'm happy. If the circumstances are bad, then I'm really sad and I'm really down and I'm really out. And so how do I find God's help, God's presence, and what the Lord would have for me to do and find strength for the journey? So let's look at Elijah this morning, 1 Kings chapter 19. I want to give you a quick review of 1 Kings 18. Many of you are very familiar with the story. Let me just give those of you who might not be just a quick overview. In 1 Kings number 18, the children of Israel have been rebelling against God, been very unfaithful towards God, and God had punished them with a severe drought. For years, drought has come. The crops have all dried up. Their livestock have died. It has been a rough patch. When we get to 1 Kings number 18, God is promising that he's going to come alongside his people and he's going to bring rain again. And so you may remember this great epic moment where the prophets of Baal and Elijah are going to come together. The prophets of Baal, there are 450 of them. The prophets of Baal uh, worship and lead the people to worship a pagan god, Baal, who we know doesn't really exist. And so 450 prophets of Baal and one Elijah, the prophet of God. And so here's what Elijah tells them. He says, I'll tell you what, let's build an altar. We'll put a sacrifice on it. And you call out to Baal that he would consume the sacrifice. And if Baal consumes the sacrifice, he will be God. But if he doesn't, then I'm going to call out to Jehovah God, my God, and we'll see if my God will consume the altar. So you know the story. Many of you do. They build an altar, and uh, they put their sacrifice on it. The prophets of Baal did. And they begin to cry out to Baal to consume the fire. 450 of them, more people than I think are probably in here this morning, are all crying out to God, loud in prayer, Hey, Baal, send fire, consume the sacrifice. Well, you know maybe how the story goes. They keep crying out to him louder and louder, and he's not listening. And, 
and nothing is happening. And so Elijah begins to poke uh, the prophets of Baal. He said, maybe your God is asleep today. You remember that? It's so cool. Maybe your God's sleeping today. Maybe your God has gone on a vacation. Maybe your God is too busy to listen to you. The prophets of Baal are taking knives and cutting themselves and nothing's happening. So here's what Elijah does. Elijah says, I tell you what, let's, let's build a big old moat, a big old, big old ditch around the altar, and uh, let's fill it full of water. And so they fill it full of water, pour water on the sacrifice, pour water on the wood, and you guys remember, Elijah goes, okay, God, to prove that you really are God and you, who you say you are, would you consume the sacrifice? And God does. God sends fire and immediately consumes the wood, the sacrifice, and all the water that's in the ditch. And the people begin in 1 Kings 18, they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And so they begin to proclaim it over and over again. The Lord, he is God. And then God said to Elijah, Elijah, take the prophets of Baal down by the river and uh, I want you to execute them. And so all the prophets of Baal are taken down to the river and they are all cut with the sword and killed and executed in the judgment of God upon them because they've been promoting a pagan idol so that's where elijah had been i mean elijah's number one i mean you, you got him out he's a superstar everybody's talking about elijah the prophet did you see what elijah the prophet did did you hear about elijah the prophet and what elijah did? if the polling were out he's leading in the polling you know what i'm talking about here he's well ahead in the polling every news agency every one of them want to have elijah on to talk about what he did there at mount carmel and so he's a big deal right now he is on the mountaintop, but he's not going to stay on the mountaintop. And that's really where we're going to kind of focus today. What happens from the mountaintop to the valley? How is it that he can't just stay up there? My guess is that we took long enough this morning. We could talk about in the room today. Some of you have been on the mountaintop, maybe spiritually in your life, maybe personally, maybe professionally. Man, you've been up there, job is great, you're getting a raise, you're getting a promotion, I mean, you're mountaintop. You, you just got this wonderful house or boat or car or lake, whatever it is that puts you on a mountaintop. You're up there, you know what that feels like, but you've also been down in the valley as well. Everything's coming unglued, everything's breaking, things are not good, job's not good, whatever it might be. Spiritually in the room today, what about the mountaintop experiences you've had in your life? I was just trying to think about in my own life, you know, maybe the revival that I attended. So all these people get saved and baptized. Maybe in my own life personally, it's an incredible retreat that I went on one time. And, and God just drew so close to me. And I remember, man, I never felt so close to God. Never been so great. But then you can think about some of those times when it seems like everything life's coming unglued. Somebody you love and care about has suddenly died. In a phone call, life changes, right? That can happen. And so how do I manage my life from the mountaintop to the valley, knowing that I can't always stay and live on the mountaintop? So let's look at where he currently is. We know where he had been. He's a rock star, Elijah the prophet. Now go to chapter number 19. I want you to see how quickly things can change. Remember I said things can change in a phone call? If you've never had that happen, it can Things can change in a moment, just like this. In 19, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Ahab and Jezebel are not good people. As a matter of fact, the scripture says Ahab is one of the wickedest kings Israel ever had. Ahab and Jezebel, they're married. And so when all this had happened and all the prophets of Baal got killed, in 18, Elijah tells Ahab, Ahab, it's about to start raining, dude. It hadn't rained in three years, but it's going to rain and rain and rain and rain. You better get in your chariot. You better get home because the roads are about to get muddy, and you're not going to make it so go. So Ahab does, and he goes back, and he goes to Jezebel, and he walks in with his head down. Guys, you know what I'm talking about, right? He walks in like, I got some bad news, honey. I just came from Mount Carmel, and uh, you're not going to believe what you're not going to believe what Elijah did. <laughs> your prophets are dead, honey. You mean he killed one of my prophets? No, honey, he killed all 450 of your prophets. They all dead. Ahab comes running home to Jezebel. The news is not good. Also, how he executed the prophets with a sword. Number two, 
Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Jezebel motioned to one of the messengers and said, You go tell Elijah, by this time tomorrow he'll be dead. You get that word to Elijah. Go, go take, you get it to him right now. Hmm. So Elijah, you've been on the mountaintop. Everything would be great. But notice what happens in verse 3. When he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. The messenger comes, so Elijah says, Elijah, Jezebel said, you'll be dead by this time tomorrow. Elijah says, thank you very much, and he took off running. Out of fear for his life, he is scared to death. Ahab and Jezebel, very powerful people. Elijah's a prophet of the Lord God. And so now he's fearful and he's running. Do you hear what Elijah said? I mean, Ahab said. He said, look what Elijah did. I think it's one of the first clues we get in, 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 in chapter 19. Look what Elijah did. Even Ahab, who was there and who was present, didn't understand that the power was not in Elijah, but the power was in God. The reason the sacrifice had been consumed was not because Elijah was something special, but because God is something special in Elijah. And the same is true of every one of us in the room today. There is nothing special about me, I guarantee you. I am so grateful that God chooses to use me, chooses to save me, chooses to work through my life. I am so grateful that he loves me and cares about me and knows about every single detail of my life. So it's really all about him. And that honestly will be one of the great challenges for some of you in the room today before we ever go any farther is for you to acknowledge the place that God should have in your life versus the place that he does have. For some of you, God's just not that important. He's just not. <laughs> you might not believe in him and be here today, or you might believe him a little bit, or you might say, well, if he's there, I don't really care. I don't have any idea what it means for me <laughs> in my life. So now Elijah's gone from the mountaintop, and he's, he's afraid, he's frightened. You know, sometimes in our life, you know, even as believers, we... We're most vulnerable after God has done some great work in our life. I mean, God's done something really good for us, and we feel so good and so close to God, and everything is so wonderful. And then it seems like in just a moment, we're making a, a lousy decision, or we're doing something that we shouldn't do, or we're thinking something that we shouldn't think, or we're saying something that we, we shouldn't say. How come from the mountaintop, the fall can often be very quick? And I think this is the reason. Because when we're on the mountaintop and everything is going great, sometimes we step back and we go, man, look at me. <laughs> I'm knocking it out of the park. I'm doing pretty good here. You know, I'm pretty smart. I, I'm, I'm pretty successful. I'm, I've accomplished this and I've accomplished that. And we begin to become self-sufficient. I did all these things. And this is going well for my marriage and my family, my kids right now, because of me. <laughs> when we get self-sufficient, Think about Peter. He steps out of the boat and he gets out on the water and he's looking at Jesus and everything's going great, isn't it? The storm is raging all around. Everything's great. He's walking on water for goodness sake. All the other apostles, way to go, Peter. Never seen that before. That's really cool. And then Peter, Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to look at the storm and immediately he sinks. For a moment, Peter began to think, huh. I don't really need to keep my eyes on Jesus. He shifted his eyes to the storm and he, and he sank. Elijah's going to lose his courage and he's going to begin to run. He had just seen 450 prophets of Baal killed. He just called down fire from God. And the storm is going to suck the life and the power and the strength and the courage out of him. We got some Christians in the room today. That defines your life. 
There was a time you were living for God and honoring God and, and, and following God, but something happened somewhere along the journey. Something stepped into your life. I'm not sure what it might have been. And now instead of pursuing God and loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you run. You don't even realize maybe that you're running, but you are. You're running away from him, and you're running away from being close to him and letting him have control of your life. And sometimes maybe it's a storm that comes into your life. Maybe it's a heartache or a difficulty that so rocked your world, you lost any hope or faith in God and his power and his strength. I don't know what it might have been. Somebody that you love maybe died tragically. Something happened. So whatever it might have been but the storm. Let me just tell you something about storms so that every Christian in the room understands. Storms are inevitable in life. If you live long enough, you are going to face a storm. I promise. We have said here for many, many years, there's either a storm on the horizon and we see it coming, or I am living in the midst of a storm, or I am just coming out of a storm. That's what storms are like. So if you haven't faced a disappointment or a heartache or a difficulty or a challenge, one is coming. And as a Christian, you need to know, what am I going to do when a storm comes? What am I going to do when life comes unglued? What am I going to do when my wife doesn't want to be married to me anymore? What am I going to do when one of my kids rebels against me and I don't know how to help them or how to do anything about it? How am I going to do when work tells me I don't have a job there anymore and I don't know how I'm going to pay the mortgage how am I going to handle the storms of life? We need to be careful as Christians that we don't get too proud or too pious. I think it's not going to happen to me. No, be careful. All of us, I think, have been frightened at one time or another. We have been afraid. We have been worried. We've been anxious. We've been concerned. We've not been sure where to turn or what to do or how to go about getting through this season or this time in my life. I don't know what God's doing. I don't know what he wants me to do. I don't know where I need to be. <laughs> we know where he was. He was frightened. He was running. But not always is he frightened and running. Look at verse number four. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. It's enough. I give up. Enough is enough. Really, Elijah? One chapter ago, you were uh, calling down fire from God. One chapter ago, you were executing 450 prophets of Baal. One chapter ago, the people are all shouting, Elijah, Elijah, the Lord, he is God. One moment ago, you were a rock star, and now you're under a tree calling out to God, I want you to just take my life. I don't want to live anymore. Elijah's exhausted, I'm sure. He's been through a lot. He's been a spiritual mountaintop. He's exuded all this energy. He's, you know, he's, it, it's sometimes in service of the Lord, you get a little tired, maybe get a little weary. Maybe he's weary of mind, weary of heart, weary of spirit. I don't know. In the midst of his exhaustion, his fatigue, even though he's been to the mountaintop, even though he's not a bad person, he's a prophet of God, he's a good guy, life is looking, looking rough, tough. I hope you've never been at the point where you have said, God, I don't want you just to take my life. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to live anymore. I hope you've never reached that point in your life. I just want you to know, resoundingly, God said you are created with a purpose and a reason that you are here. And in the deepest, darkest moment when you might think, this is not worth going on, you just know God has a reason and a purpose. He put you here, and he loves you, and he cares about you. There's something he wants you to do. He gave you life, and it's not ours to take away. Just know that, all right? Enough is enough. 
I want you to never doubt that God loves you and that he cares about you and he knows every detail of your life. I think maybe all of us at one time or another, we feel like God's so far away, isn't he? I mean, he lives up in the heavens somewhere, way out there, and I'm just one little person here, and I know he, he's too busy to care about what's going on in my life, or he's, he's not concerned about me. He's concerned about other people, but maybe you haven't been very faithful to him, or you haven't walked with him or loved him very much, and so you think, well, he's sort of turned his back on me because I turned my back on him, maybe, and nothing could be farther from the truth. I want every person in the room today to know God knows every single detail about your life, everything. He said, I know the hair on your head. I know when a sparrow falls to the ground. So just know that every person in the room today, even if you're running from him or want nothing to do with him, or even if you've said, I don't believe in him, it does not change this amazing, incredible love that he has for you. It's amazing. It's amazing. He loves you and he knows every detail of your life and he cares about you and he cares about what's going on. He doesn't know that my marriage is falling apart. Sure he does. He doesn't know the financial press that is on me and my family right now. Yes, he does. He doesn't know I went to the doctor and I just got this horrible news. Sure he does. He knows everything, absolutely everything about you and he loves you and he's close by that's what he's going to show Elijah notice verse number five then as he lay and slept under the broom tree suddenly an angel touched him and said to him arise and eat remember Elijah says I want to die enough's enough life's too hard I just want to die and at the next moment an angel of the Lord comes near to him Everybody in the room, listen to me. No matter where you are, God is right beside you. And you think, I'm going to give up. I throw my hands up in the air. I'm not going to try anymore. I've given up on God. I've given up on church. I've given up on all that. Listen, you may have given up on all those things, but God, not for a moment, has given up on you. It's the most incredible love story. And the presence of God comes close by to you. Hold your finger in 1 Kings. Anybody got anywhere to be around 12? Uh, hold, hold your finger there. It's been a long time. This is fun. Uh, go to Psalms. Psalms. In the middle of your Bible. I want to show you something. I saw this back several months ago now and just kind of blew me away. Psalms 22. As a pastor, year and year and years upon years, I, I've read Psalm 23. Funerals, other places, Psalm 23. Beautiful patches. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We all know that. Good stuff. And then I read Psalm 22 one time and really looked at what it said. Remember, David is writing, King David, uh, powerful man, man after God's own heart. Everything's good. He's good looking. He's powerful, strong, courageous, leads the great nation. Except right now he's running from his life because people are trying to kill him. It's a difficult time in his life. And David, listen to Psalm 22. Here's David. Maybe this has been us. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, you remain silent. That's a man after God's own heart, crying out to God. God, where are you? God ministers to him in Psalm 22. And look at 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of my enemies. Save me from the lion's mouth. The very last phrase, you, O God, have answered You've answered me. And then when he gets to Psalm 23, he says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. Have you ever felt like in the room today that God's not listening? He's so far away. 
You want to just say, God, why have you forsaken me? Why do you not listen to me? Why don't you answer me? Don't you care? And the resounding answer is, I am your strength, and I want to help you, and I have never been more close by than I am. I will help you. That is a message to every person in the room today. I will help you, regardless of where you are. God says, I will help you. God is present, and God makes provision. Notice what happens in in verse 5. He says, arise and eat. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water, and he ate, and he drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat again, because, watch this, the journey is too great for you alone. The journey is too great for you alone. If there's anything Rodney Alexander needs to learn, and probably most of us in the room today, it's this, that the journey is too great for us alone. I'm just like a lot of you in the room today. I mean, there are times I think, God, I got this. I'll call you if I need you. God, I can take care of this. I, I, I can figure this out. I'm, I'm, I'm not super smart, but I can put a few things together, and I've got it. I'll take care of this. I'll work this out. You Go spend your time with somebody else. I'm okay. I'm all right. I guess most of us in the room have done that. Maybe you're doing that right now. I don't really need God. I had a good job. I got a nice house. Got a nice family. Got money in the bank. Boat at the lake. I, I don't know how much I really need God. You hear what the scripture says? To a man who was at the mountaintop just one chapter ago, calling down the power of God, killing the 450 prophets of Baal, who is now frightened and running and wants to die. And God says, Elijah, here's your problem. You need to understand this journey is too great for you by yourself. I don't care how strong you are in the room today or how, how incredibly brilliant and smart you think you are or the resources you've amassed you are not strong enough alone to navigate this life you might think that you are but you are not and the storm is going to come sooner or later and it's going to be hard and it's going to be devastating and you're going to be discouraged and down and i want you to remember that the journey is too great for you by yourself Elijah had every reason in the world to brag in 1 Kings 18, but in 1 Kings 19, he just wants to die. Where are you going to turn? Where are you going to turn for the strength and the help that you need? Notice verse number 8. He arose and he ate and he drank, and he went in the strength of that 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, The mountain of God. In the strength and the provision of God, here's where he's going. He is going to Mount Horeb, which is known as the mountain of God. When everything else is coming unglued, everything else is difficult, I don't know if I want to live anymore or not, enough is enough. He runs to the mountain of God. He's looking for help, and he's looking for strength. Where you turn and to whom you turn is going to determine your ultimate destination. Where you turn and to whom you turn is going to determine your ultimate destination. You get that, right? Every one of us in the room, most of us are adults in here. We have God-given opportunity to make choices for ourselves, decide things for ourselves. What's going to be important to me? What's not going to be important to me? What am I going to do? What am I not going to do? God has given us all these freedom and opportunities. And the choices that you are making are going to determine your ultimate destination. Am I going to live in the bondage of sin and indifference and apathy and heartache and in the self-sufficiency that I think can get me through this life, would that be my choice? 
Or would I go to the mountain of God to seek the provision and the strength and the help of God to get me through what can be a very challenging world and a very challenging life? Elijah is on his way to the mount of God. Now, I want you to notice what happens next. Look at your Bible. There he went into a cave, and he spent the night in that place. I'm in verse number 9. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? God comes to Elijah, and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? (laughs) It's kind of funny when you think about it, because God had just told him a verse before, Go to the mountain of God, and Elijah went to the mountain of God. But now, what are you doing here? Here's what he's saying. He says, What? What's your state of mind right now, Elijah? What, what, are you, what are you thinking? Debbie and I raised three children. There were times I would sit them down, and that's exactly what I'd say to them. I'd say, what in the world are you thinking? You know what I was saying, right? Why did you make that choice? Why did you do that? Why did you get in that relationship? Why did you go there? Why? You all of a sudden got bad grades. That didn't happen overnight. How and where are you right now? Most of the time, my kids could figure it out pretty quick. It was amazing. Hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? Would you be willing to listen to God this morning and God ask you that question? Whoa, whoa, that's very personal. If God asked you, what are you doing here, how would you answer him? And I don't mean your wife drug you or your grandmother made you come. I don't mean any of that stuff. I mean, what are you doing in the state of your life right now? God asks you, hey, Rodney, what are are you doing here? What are you going to say? What are you doing here? Your state of mind, the way you're living, the choices you're making. The pursuit, either you're pursuing the world or you're pursuing God, that's not hard. Either you're loving God or you're loving the world, that's not hard. But what is your state of mind today? And God says, what are you doing here? Listen to what Elijah tells him. Don't let this be. In verse number 10. So Elijah said, in the whiniest voice you can imagine, I have been very zealous. I'm sorry. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altar, and killed your prophets with a sword. And wait on it, I alone am left. And they want to kill me. Wah, wah, wah. I mean, that really is where this is. Elijah, I'm the prophet of God. Did you see what I did on Mount Carmel? Those 450 prophets' heads got cut off. I'm boss. To, oh, God, it's just me. I'm all by myself. The children of Israel, they don't love you, but I love you. And it's me, it's me, and only despairs even for life I'm alone God I'm all by myself there's nobody else that cares it's kind of funny with Elijah but it's not so funny when it's us how many times have we whined before God God that wasn't fair it wasn't fair everybody's got it better than me We whine. All by myself down here. Nobody really cares. My family doesn't care. My husband doesn't care. My kids don't care. Nobody cares. The people at work, they treat me terrible. They don't treat me with respect like I deserve to be treated. And it's just me and only me. And we have our little pity party. That's where Elijah is having his little pity party. I am alone. Please know in the room today, you are not alone. 
God said he would never leave nor forsake you. You are very much in the presence and the care of God who loves you more than anybody else on the planet. You are loved and you are cared for. You are not alone. You are not by yourself. Elijah was not alone on Mount Carmel and he is not alone on Mount Horeb. And so God's going to respond to him. Not in the way that you might think. Watch, watch what happens next. Verse 11. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and there was a great and strong wind, tore into the mountains, broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Elijah, go out and stand out there. So Elijah did. There's an earthquake. We don't have many earthquakes around here, thank goodness. But earth, that would be scary. There was a huge, great wind blew. Then there was fire that came. But there was no word from God. Nothing. But after the fire, the end of verse 12, there is a still, small voice. Still small voice. There's some people in the room today. You're waiting on God to you're waiting on God to paint something on your bedroom wall. You're waiting to wake up at night and it be written on the ceiling in your home. You should follow God. You should be more faithful to God. You should love God more and do do right by Him. Or you're gonna see it in the clouds, right? You're gonna be looking up one day and there the clouds are all gonna come together and it's gonna say, Get it together down there, Rodney. If God would do that for you, you would get serious about him, right? Come on. If it's on your bedroom wall, on the ceiling, in the clouds, you get an anonymous email, well, I don't know what it is, but it's something big and bold, you would change the direction of your life, wouldn't you? You'd get serious about following him, loving him, doing the right thing. That's what, they, if you could just get that. Elijah didn't get that. a still small voice and I think there's a couple of reasons for that number one number one to hear God you've got to be listening for God let me say that again to hear God you've got to be listening for God Let's be honest. We got some, some of us here today, we, we, we don't care whether God speaks to us or not. I got a plan. I got my life. I'm doing my own thing. I'm going my own direction. God, you can just have your way and do your own thing, but I'm not interested. If you're going to hear from him, you've got to be listening. I think there's a second thing here. If you're going to hear from God, you've got to stop talking so much. And by talking, I just mean living your life, living large, doing what you want, going your own way, bigger than life. God, I don't really need you, but when I do, I know you're there and I'll call on you. Elijah probably thought there'd be some great, big, profound thing like 1 Kings 18. That was pretty profound. But God comes in a still, small voice and he speaks. And when he does, you've got to be listening. And you've got to be ready to respond to him. Verse number 13. So it was, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, I didn't make this up. Look what it says. What are you doing here Elijah. Hey, Elijah. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Same question. He'd ask him two other times. How'd you let yourself get here? How'd you get yourself in this position? What's the state of your mind? 
What in the world are you thinking, Elijah? What are you doing here? You're going to be surprised to know. You know what Elijah says? He starts whining. I'm sorry. He's like, oh. Nah. He goes, it's just me, God. The children of Israel are horrible, but it's me and only me. I am all alone. He said it again. And then God says, no, Elijah, it's not just you. I got 7,000 people just like you. They've not bent their knee to the prophet of Baal. They are very much a part of the work and the mission that I am on. You are not by yourself, young man. And so I ask you this morning as we close, if God, as he speaks to you and he asks you, where are you? What are you going to say? Where are you? Oh, God, I'm living large, enjoying life. 90 miles an hour down the road, man. Is that where you are? Drifting, maybe, away from God. Maybe not in a good place. Far from Him. Oh, you still believe in Him, maybe, but just not following Him. Maybe everything in your life has come unglued. And man, you really need to know that God does care about you. He is close by. He is present. He wants to make provision for you. And there's no one that he loves more than he loves you. He knows everything about you. And he is close by today to help you. Is that where you are? Are you willing to say, God, I've been, I've been trying to make it on my own. But honestly, there, there's something missing. I got this void inside of me. I don't know what it is exactly. But I don't feel right about it or good about it. I need to do something about it. God, this is where I am. This is where I am. Would you bow your heads with me, please? With our heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment, I'm going to ask our band to go ahead and be coming. Right where you're sitting, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or raise your hand or, or do anything like that, but I am going to ask you to just pose this question in your mind. Why are you here? Why are you here? God asked Elijah that three different times. Trying to get Elijah to look within his own life and his own heart and answer the question, how did I go from being on the mountaintop to wanting to die to running and hiding? Why are you here? Where is it that God wants you to go now? What does he want you to do? You can continue to drift. God will let you do that. He loves you enough. He'll let you drift. You can run from him. He'll let you do that. You don't have to believe. He'll let you do that too. He'll let you continue to wallow in heartache and difficulty. But you don't have to keep doing that. Strength for the journey is to know that we are never alone, that God is always with us, and God is sufficient to help us, no matter what. This morning, right where you're sitting, without drawing any attention to yourself at all, you can just pray in your heart, God, I think I understand where I am. It's not where I want to stay. God, would you help me? Would you help me? And you can respond to him this morning, right where you are. The altar at our church is always open. We're going to sing two songs in just a second. The altar is always open. You are welcome to come and kneel and pray here today. I'll be here at the front. If you need somebody to talk to or pray with, you can come and talk to me or pray with me. And we've got some other wonderful people here. Be glad to do the same thing. Don't not do something if God is telling you to. Father, we love you with all of our heart. We forget sometimes just how close by and how present that you are. 
our heartaches and our difficulties and our challenges can seem overwhelming at times. They can discourage us and defeat us. And God, yet we know that you are there, you are present, and you want to provide for us and you want to help us. You have not forsaken us and you've not left us, but you are close. You are our shepherd who walks with us. We're so grateful. Father, may we today depend upon you more than we ever have in all of our life. Trust you. Follow you and make you the priority of our lives. And for this, Lord, we will give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's continue praising his name this morning.
so much for being here today. So, so very grateful. If you're a guest with us today, we want you to know you're especially, we're so glad you are here. If you'll fill out one of the guest cards and take it out there on the left, they'll give you a free t-shirt. Uh, we'd love for you to do that. If you're sitting in the back, there is a QR code on the back of the chairs. Uh, and my understanding is you hold your camera up, something magic happens, and uh, you can fill out something online and let us know that you were here today. But if you're a guest, thank you for coming. Uh, to our church today. Also, uh, if you need to connect somewhere at Little Flock, there's another card. looks like this, and uh, we'd love to connect with you. It may be baptism, membership. Maybe you're looking for a place to serve. Maybe you have a question or a prayer request. If you'll fill this out, drop it in any of the kiosks out there. Uh, we'll be glad to get back in touch with you this week and help in any way that we can. Thank you so much for being here. Let's join together in a prayer. Uh, bow our heads, please. I'll lead us in a closing prayer. Father God, we thank you so very much for the privilege that is ours to come and worship with our family and with our friends to a place where we are loved, to a place where we know we can be ministered and cared for, and most importantly, to a place where we feel your presence and we know that you are truly close by. And God, that gives us such a good feeling. Lord, we love you. Help us to depend upon you this week is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so very much, and you're dismissed.